Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick O'Carroll. I'm head of health system strengthening at the Task Force for Global Health, and I'm very glad to be with you here virtually. I'm sorry I can't be with you there in person at the ninth bioregional TEFINET scientific conference. But I do welcome this opportunity to share with you some of the interesting things that have happened over the past year, and in particular, some great work that we were able to do together with a bunch of your colleagues and probably several people there in the room with you now in developing a roadmap for future development of FETP throughout the world. So let's begin. What I'd like to share with you today is a report of a meeting that we had of about 19 of your fellow colleagues um, at the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center in Bellagio, Italy last June. But before we begin, let me take you back. This is an article from 1990 that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association talking about a new international health resource called the Field Epidemiology Training Programs. The fundamental elements of this article are in this box. They, they defined FETPs as training and service programs. That's very important. It's not merely training, but also service. Designed to develop field epidemiologists in countries throughout the world. The first sponsor, and still the largest sponsor, was the US CDC. It was based on the Epidemic Intelligence Service that CDC sponsors. And the goal was to have country-owned, sustained epidemiology capacity in the countries that had FETP programs. The approach from the beginning has been training through service, which means that throughout the training period, actual services being provided to the ministries of health in the countries where the FETPs were lodged. And that's very important because many people think of this merely as a training program when in fact it is also and very fundamentally a health system strengthening program that provides service throughout the training period. So that's in 1990. The background further is that since that time there's been enormous growth in this initiative. Um, the number of programs has grown, the scope of what they undertake has grown, and the complexity of the kind of work they're asked to do uh, has also grown. In general, it's been a terrific success, but with that growth, new challenges have emerged. For example, um, the originally hoped for institutionalization of these programs has been rather slow. Some countries have institutionalized the programs and they now own them and they provide not only financial support, but programmatic support, institutional support, and, uh, and mentorship, all supported within country uh, resources. A second challenge that's arisen is assuring quality. We now have 70 something programs around the world that are part of the TEFINET network and ensuring that they are all of at least equal quality or basic quality is a major challenge when you're managing something like this globally. Securing funding remains an important project problem. It was a problem in 1975. It remains a problem to this day. Assuring a career path for graduates of the field epi training programs is very important. There are quite a number of instances where people have been trained for two years, have provided service for two years, and then left the country to find work. That clearly was not the original goal of the FETPs. There's also a need to adapt to changes in disease threats and also to adapt to new techniques and new technologies that have become available since 1975 to enable epidemic detection, for example, and epidemic investigation. Um, in short, there's a need to modernize the field epi training programs that naturally occurs as, as the programs grow and as time passes. Another challenge that's arisen is the idea of mobilizing for cross-border mutual aid, which is to say when there is an international outbreak, as we've recently had in the Congo, for example, um, the idea of FETP fellows who've been trained in, in exactly this kind of work, crossing international boundaries and helping, that's already happening in Africa, but we need to make that a much more um, consistent and planful way of, of uh, fostering those kinds of mobilizations. So those challenges have arisen as the very successful FETP program has grown. The idea then behind the Bellagio meeting was this, to bring together a wide cross-section of leaders of field epi programs around the world, the implementing partners, as well as the funders and other stakeholders for a series of days of meetings where we could really wrestle with the major challenges that I just outlined and develop actionable recommendations that give us a path forward. Um, it's my understanding that many of these challenges have been recognized and talked about for a long time. The idea of this meeting was to take definitive steps towards solving some of these longstanding problems. Now the role of the Task Force for Global Health, which may not be familiar to many of you, um, this is exactly the kind of thing the task force would undertake. One of our signature abilities, if you will, is to bring together people from different organizations who are working toward a common goal and help those different organizations that approach it from different perspectives craft a common way forward and then to help where we can in guiding those organizations toward uh, a common path. So this kind of work, bringing together all the different players, including TEFINET, which happens to be the task for global health, but many other players as well, regional network leaders, field epi training program directors, colleagues at CDC, at WHO, and so forth, 
this is the kind of thing the task force does well, is to bring folks like this together so they can find their way forward. The goal of the meeting at the Bellagio Center, which is pictured here, is to develop a comprehensive roadmap for our partnership that will guide all of us as we address those challenges and strengthen our coll collaboration into the future. There were 19 participants because that's exactly as much as Bellagio will allow us. Uh, they're listed on the board here. You'll recognize many of them. And again, many, several of these people may be at the meeting with you there. The planning committee are highlighted here in blue. Dr. Kip Baggett from CDC, Dr. Dionisio Herrera from the TEFINET program here at the task force, Professor Martin Kirk uh, from the Field Epi Training Program in Australia, and myself and Ms. Ellen Wild from the Task Force for Global Health. Looking at the participants by agency affiliation gives you a sense of the range of different organizations that were represented. Quite a number of Field Epi Training Programs were there, uh, as well as directors of two regional networks and TEFINET, as well as colleagues from CDC, from ECDC, from WHO, and I'll get to that in a minute, from uh, FAO, um, Food and Agriculture Organization, from AONFI, which has to do with uh, fostering national public health institutes, as well as potential funders uh, and partners from the Gates Foundation, from Deloitte, and then those of us from the Task Force for Global Health. Now, I mentioned the outbreak of uh, Ebola in the Congo, and it would be because of that outbreak that at the last minute, unfortunately, Dr. Morgan from the WHO was not able to participate, although that was our sincere hope because WHO is a very important partner in assuring that all countries develop the capacity we're talking about in epidemiology. These next couple of slides are really just photographs to show you that we really were doing work. Uh, Bellagio is a very lovely place, and you can imagine that we were all there playing tennis, um, but uh, in fact, there were tennis courts right outside the window, as you can see here. Uh, but the truth was, uh, everyone worked very hard and came back right after breaks and stayed late to get all this work done, and I was very edified by the uh, professional and professionalism and dedication of everyone who attended. The first thing we did was an exercise to develop a common vision. As you read this, you probably think, well, this is already my vision. But the truth is, we had never articulated what, what our final mile looked like. If we really did what we set out to do comprehensively and declared success, what does success look like? And this is the vision that we conjured up, that every country in the world would have the applied epidemiology capacities needed to protect and promote the health of its own population and to collaborate with others to promote global health. So there's their own country's protection and the idea of global health security built into this. Built into this also is the idea that every country in the world needs these capacities. And that's something that we saw no reason to, to set a lower bar. The other nuance I want to mention here is the idea of applied epidemiology capacities. We had some discussion about whether field epidemiology was the better, better term or applied epidemiology. And the truth was, uh, different people had different opinions. We settled on applied epidemiology, but we use that phrase interchangeably with field epidemiology. The second thing we did after developing our vision was to develop a common framework for action. We wanted to make sure we were looking at this problem from the same perspective. Let me take you back again to 1975, when the original idea was, gosh, CDC has this thing called the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which we now know as a field epidemiology training program. It's working wonders for the United States of America. Wouldn't this be great if other countries had this too? And if we could get some grant money, maybe we could get started. Canada develops a, a similar program, um, in many ways the second field epidemiology training program. But the first FETP supported by the United States was actually in Thailand. I think in 1980. Um, so that's how it began. Let's replicate CDC's EIS program in countries that want to do that. Many years have passed since then, of course, and what we have in 2018 is much more than a CDC grant program. We now have a complex, global, multi-partner undertaking to assure applied epidemiology capacity throughout the world. There are multiple people working on this. There's multiple levels at the regional and national and global levels, as well as WHO. Um, there are multiple partners that have a stake in this, uh, and there are multiple funders with increasing funding from the European Union and from WHO, and from, importantly, many countries themselves. So this is no longer a CDC grant program. This is becoming a global multi-partner international effort to assure this epidemiology. It's a different way of looking at it. Now, if that is our framework, this 2018 framework, if that's how we view it, then it follows that there is something that we're going to call the FETP enterprise. Some people don't like this term uh, because they think of Star Trek, but uh, the truth is it could be the FETP undertaking or the global FETP effort or initiative, but we settled on FETP enterprise. And what we mean by that is the totality of the leaders, the funders, the implementing partners like TEFINET, like SafetyNet, 
um, the government agencies, and all the other stakeholders that are engaged in this global effort, along with the workforce and competency targets, and the standards, and the agreements, and the technologies, and all those things that we've built over the years that undergird this effort. That's what we mean when we say the FETP enterprise. Clearly, we're not simply talking now about a CDC grant program, but really a huge global undertaking. Think about the FETP enterprise as having a set of functions, things that it must do to take us to that final mile where every country has applied EPI capacity. The first two things we'll mention are the ones you're already familiar with. It's what every FETP does. It strengthens the public health system through service, and it educates and trains and mentors and provides experience to the FETP fellows. That's an FETP program. But the overall enterprise does much more. It works to be able to mobilize, to provide mutual assistance in time of need. It works to assure and improve quality of programs across regions and across international boundaries. It works to help institutionalize the FETPs and to foster ways to help countries take ownership of the FETPs and provide their own programmatic and institutional support. It does a variety of other things listed there on the right. And most importantly, at the end I'm highlighting here where it it says this FETP enterprise has as a major function to manage the FETP enterprise strategically, which is to say someone has to be in charge of all the other things I just listed above. Someone's got to own evaluating the impact. Someone's got to manage the projects. Someone's got to do the operational research. Someone has to work on quality. Who's in charge of making sure that happens? Up to this point, it's been done in a variety of ways and frankly done pretty well in a variety of ways through advisory boards, through CDC guidance, through uh, initiatives that certain regions or regional networks will foster, through uh, hallway conversations, frankly, through the global meetings where we talk with each other and come up with ideas and think of pilots that we can try. But the sense of Bellagio was, if we're going to get to 100% of countries with field heavy capacity, we're going to have to have an organization or a body that owns the responsibility for seeing to it that it gets done. And that leads to our first recommendation. We felt that there's a, the need, a broadly representative group of key partners and stakeholders should be explicitly tasked with the strategic management function of the FETP enterprise. That means that they've got to be empowered to monitor it, to decide when actions and changes are needed, to consider those possible options, and weigh the benefits and problems with each of the potential choices, and then to recommend, or more importantly, take actions to see to it that those changes take place. Now, if, you, if you've been involved with FETP for any length of time, you're probably thinking, well, why couldn't TEFINET do that? Or why couldn't the advisory board do that? Or why couldn't CDC lead a small group to do that? And the truth is, there's a number of ways you could get this done. We don't specify at Bellagio the right way. There are a number of ways that would work. Um, but the first thing we need to do is decide what that body is and then empower them to do the, the things we just talked about, to see to it that these enterprise functions are undertaken. That's number one. There are quite a number of other recommendations I'm going to go through fairly quickly. Um, we felt that there was an important need to identify changes that are needed in all aspects of the FETP enterprise, including the curriculum, for example, and to adapt what we're doing incrementally while preserving core principles. Now, probably the fundamental core principle that you'll all resonate with is the idea that this must al always be learned by doing. This must always be service-based training. So as long as it's that, and it doesn't become a research project, for example, we're staying true to the original vision. Having said that, though, there are a number of possibilities for making the system even better, for, for adapting the training to meet the needs that are evolving over time based on new challenges, based on changes in demography, based on new opportunities from technology and so forth. So that's one of the, the important recommendations is that this strategic management group needs to identify these changes and take action. The third recommendation is that we really need to develop country-specific epidemiology workforce targets for each of the program levels, from basic, which in some countries is called frontline, to intermediate, which is the sort of one-year training, to advanced, which is the traditional two-year training FETP program. Now, one of the reasons that we felt this was very important is if you're going to go to your ministry and say, we need funds to provide more epi training, and they say, well, how many epidemiologists do you need? And you say, well, we don't know, but we know we need more than we've got. That's just not a compelling argument. Um, nor is it compelling to say, well, we've all agreed each country needs two, because every country is different, um, and, and the needs vary, and their abilities to, to support them vary. So we need to do, perhaps, operational research, uh, or certainly look at what science, scientific evidence exists 
to guide how each country can take its parameters, its percent rural versus urban, for example, or the age of its workforce, or age of retirement, or other things that are relevant to workforce, to take those things into account and say, well, given our background, given our disease burden, given where we are, given what we can afford, these are the targets we want to set for ourselves, and have that be an information-based, data-based, evidence-based kind of target-making process. We don't have that in hand, and we felt this would be very important if we're going to try to drive each country to invest in its own um, workforce development. The fourth recommendation that came out of these deliberations was we really need to accelerate institutionalization, by which we mean the full integration of these programs into the country's public health systems, into the ministries of health, ideally. Now, every country may do this slightly differently. Some may very much encourage the use of uh, university systems to get the actual training managed. But at the end of the day, the idea is that it is the country that's themselves that have the capacity to deploy field epidemiologists and use them to guide decision making at their ministry level and, and all the way down to the village level. So we need to work to accelerate institutionalization. It's not enough to say that it ought to happen. We need to work collectively to figure out how to help it happen faster. Because if it happens faster, as more and more countries online come online investing in it themselves, that frees up resources to help other countries that are trying to get started. So to the extent that we don't do this, our progress will slow. To the extent that we do do this, our progress will accelerate. So it's an important piece of getting to our vision. The fifth recommendation is we thought that we really needed to develop a more elaborate framework for cross-border mobilization of FETP fellows and alumni. Now, AFINET, for example, in Africa is already doing this to some extent with, with uh, field epidemiology training program fellows. Um, and they've got that working and there's much to learn from what they've done. TEFINET has be begun to do this using their uh, TEFI Connect system, whereby they can identify people who, for example, speak French or are in the region or have had this training and have the qualifications and are ready to deploy. And they can share that with the uh, WHO bodies and partners that are making decisions about deployment. But we're only really just beginning this process. We're still at the beginning of figuring out what should this look like globally. If we're going to do this in Argentina or Mongolia, um, what kind of framework needs to be in place to facilitate uh, field deputy training program fellows uh, and graduates uh, crossing borders to assist each other in time of need? And that's something we also felt should be worked on. Continuing on now with number six, we want to continue to improve program quality. This is, as mentioned, been recognized for a long time, and there's a tremendous amount of good work already going on with the FETP accreditation process. We want to see that continue. We want to expand it, and we want to see eventually every program accredited as, and demonstrating that, in fact, they're doing all the things they set out to do, and, and we want to assist them in every way possible. So this is yet something, again, for the strategic management group to work on. The seventh and final recommendation had to do with assuring sustainable fundings. Now this has been a long-standing challenge and remains a challenge to this day. Um, despite the fact that we've had this astonishing success, every year it's a struggle to make sure we have the funds that we need to start new programs, to continue to support the ones we have, as well as to do all those enterprise level things that I listed before, such as the uh, accreditation, for example, or the development of TEFI Connect. Um, these things all cost money and we have to find that money. So, we really spent a lot of time on this at Bellagio and came up with several concrete ideas. One, of course, I've re referred to already, which has to do with institutionalization. To the extent that, that countries take ownership of this and are able to find support within their own ministry budgets to do this work, that frees up funding for us to grow. But in addition to that, we felt there were some other ideas I want to share with you here. The first, and one of the most exciting, was it was felt that we really need to, to be honest about this and to develop a compelling evidence-based story that will convince people to invest in, in FETPs. Our ministries, our philanthropies, our, our governments, our ministers, our legislators, our community village leaders. We, we need a, a way to tell a story that is truly evidence-based and that says, this is the kind of investment that makes sense. And to do this, we talked about going to an outside authoritative group that could commission a report and do a thorough investigation of the current value of what we're doing in FETP to document what that value proposition really is. And from that documentation, we developed this evidence-based narrative. This is, in the end of the day, one of the most important things we could do, frankly, to foster institutionalization, is to have an argument that isn't based just on our opinion of how valuable this would be, but in fact, on the science that demonstrates how value it really is, how valuable it really is. So that's the first thing. 
The second thing it was thought of was we might want to develop a mechanism, something like Gavi, if you're familiar with that initiative, whereby people could donate money from the private sector toward vaccines and toward the delivery of vaccines. And so we thought about developing some kind of mechanism whereby people could donate money to support field epidemiology training and service. We also thought it was important to document the actual costs of the current FETP enterprise. Because so the truth of the matter is the way it's currently funded is so uh, multi-dimensional that there's no single person that knows how much is being spent on this entire thing and where that money's going and where the biggest gaps are. And so this was something we felt was worth taking the time to do. And the last thing was to improve efficiencies wherever possible. Now, we're probably doing the best we can in general, but we felt we should take a hard look and think, how could we do business differently so that we could get the same results uh, for less money and still be effective? Um, one idea that came up, for example, is when it makes sense to transition from a CDC-assigned resident advisor to an in-country resident advisor. It doesn't always make sense to do that, and there's times when you want to wait. But where it can happen, uh, the savings can be very substantial. So that's it. This is the roadmap I wanted to share with you. It has several parts that I've reviewed with you. First, the vision statement, which sets a picture for our final mile. Success is when every country has demonstrably effective field epidemiology capacity. When we've done that, and it's self-sustaining, we've achieved our goal. We've reached the end of the road. The second thing that came out of our conversations was this idea of a new conceptual framing, that this wasn't a bunch of field epidemiology training programs that had a grant. It was instead a global undertaking with many partners, with many ministries of health, with many regional networks, with many funders and many uh, implementing partners and other uh, stakeholders that care about this, and that we're all working in this together, that it's got a variety of elements and that we need a way to manage it to get us to success. And you couple this framing and that vision statement with the seven key recommendations, that's what we believe comprises the roadmap. And it's what we believe, frankly, comprises uh, our path to the future for the global FETP enterprise. And we're hoping that with your agreement and with your improvements, this roadmap can be used by all of us at every level, from the village to the region to the country to the regional area of countries to the globe, uh, to guide our work so that all the different partners and stakeholders know what our role is, they know how to articulate our story, and they know what success looks like. And we can all work then collaboratively uh, toward reaching the end of our, our road. Our next steps, of course, we've just now finalized the proceedings, I should say, and it should be on the website, and may in fact be on the website by the time you hear my voice. So this part is essentially done. The very next step, of course, is to disseminate the report, to present it to key partners and stakeholders, like all of you at this conference, uh, thanks to our friends at SafetyNet. We'll post the report, of course, on TEFINET's website, our partner websites, hopefully CDC and other websites, uh, hopefully every FETP website. Uh, but we'll also want to publish it in a variety of other ways, too. We'll summarize this for peer-reviewed journals and see if we can't put notes in various uh, documents and journals and, and reports that people will read so they'll understand the importance of the work that we've undertaken. And then what's left to us is to implement the recommendations. So I, I wish I were there with you, because uh, you could begin to tell me what you think about this, what we forgot, what you disagree with, if anything. But most important, I would love to get your thoughts uh, about how we can proceed to implement these recommendations. Those of us who are at Bellagio are already having these conversations. We hope to be uh, talking with our friends at WHO about um, what they think about the right path to implementing some of these recommendations. And of course, we'll be talking to our funders at CDC and elsewhere about their views on this as well. So thank you for this opportunity to share these ideas with you. I hope you'll agree we, we managed to accomplish a lot in our time there at Bellagio. I am truly sorry I'm not with you there because the most valuable thing about sharing this with you is getting your ideas. So I would welcome any thoughts you might have. Uh, please feel free to email me. I'm at pocarroll at taskforce.org. Um, we'd love to improve this over time. We'd love to get your ideas about how to make it better or anything you are concerned about. But most importantly, if you have ideas about how we can begin implementing some of these recommendations, they would indeed be very welcome. Again, many thanks for your time.